Good morning. It's right about 8 o'clock. Uh, my name is James Carlin. I'm the product manager for Dampers at Podorf, and I'll be going through our AIA presentation on the fundamentals of fire, fire smoke, and smoke dampers, and a little bit of an overview of some installation and some general guidelines at the end. Just to start off, uh, Podorf is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects continuing education system. So you will be able to earn credit uh, on completion of this program. Uh, be sure to send in uh, either your AIA number or any uh, applicable information along with your email address so we can get those certificates sent off uh, to the right person in a timely fashion. Basically, we're going to be going through the principles of fire and smoke dampers, uh, combination fire, smoke dampers, fire dampers, and individual smoke dampers. And basically, we're going to talk about the different types of fire smoke dampers um, and what's approved for different types of installations, um, and then some of the uh, performance and testing requirements, and then how they're installed in the projects. We'll also talk a little bit about how um, some common questions that come up regarding installation and some general guidelines for that. And basically, to give a little bit of a background, these types of dampers uh, were put into the International Building Code in around 1994 uh, when the International Code Council uh, unified to create a standard code officiating body. So the BOCA, Southern Building Code, IBCO joined together to set up this code council that can get a standardized code. This helped engineers to have a universal code that they can use throughout the country so there weren't little nuances in different regions, which an engineer can get a whole a handle of once they're in their own region, but if they're, say, designing outside of a region, they may not be as versed in some of the local nuances. And to get around that and to get a standardized ver version of the code, they, they introduced the International Building Code, the International Mechanical Code, and the whole suite of international codes. Uh, this started in 97 with widespread adoption around the year 2000. Now, what those international codes call out typically are both UL rated dampers and dampers that meet NFPA specifications. Uh, one question that we do get a lot with NFPA is sometimes we're asked if there was a damper certified to say NFPA uh, 92A or NFPA 90A. And there is no such thing as an NFPA certification, but what the way it works is NFPA uh, sets up some type of UL certification or some type of standard for whatever product it is, whether it's a fire door, um, a penetration of a duct, and it has to comply typically with UL standards. So as long as you test to UL standards, you can put a damper in the locations laid out in this diagram. Now, originally what the, what, uh, the International Building Code and NFPA would do would specify where these dampers, uh, need to exist. So, Originally, most of the fire protection was done with fire dampers, uh, but once they realized that smoke was a major factor for loss of life, they started putting in different smoke dampers, and there's little changes to that. Um, now that the industry is caught up to those changes, there are combination fire smoke dampers that are work as both, um, but there are also some nuances for smoke dampers and mounting them that will help you get around an existing fire damper installation. Um, some other testing and listing agencies, one would be AMCA, um, and that's really an industry organization that sets some test standards uh, so manufacturers can uniformly, eva uniformly evaluate their performance. So basically, uh, all manufacturers are certifying to a certain a set of test parameters uh, that help engineers evaluate different performance criteria. Now, fire dampers, um, typically the application is uh, required by building codes. So they're going to be different assemblies, fire rated assemblies um, that have a duct penetration that need to be protected. Uh, they still have to have their fire resistance. They have to close automatically when a fusible link reaches a certain point. Uh, typically, these are bimetallic fusible links, and I'll talk a little bit about them later. Um, they're around 165, and that set point is normally due to uh, 
closing within about 50 degrees of ambient temperature. Uh, but some higher degree fusible links are allowed if the ambient dump temperature will be higher. Uh, and basically once it's closed, it's gonna block fire from spreading through. Now these are not leakage rated dampers, so they won't be airtight and they don't have a leakage certification and we'll get into that. Um, basically the test standards that certify these types of dampers are UL555. And basically NFPA, the building code uh, uh, maintains that dampers need to be certified per UL and NFPA90, uh, kind of as a belt and suspenders, but then NFPA, NFPA 90A would call back to UL555 for the certification. And that's why fire dampers for the most part are going to be certified through UL. Uh, now they can be certified through other means, um, basically the same AS STM standards of uh, that UL uses to do their to run their fire test, uh, but typically the most industry wide certification is going to be UL with their design guide and their fire resistance design guide. Uh, a couple of things about fire dampers is typically they're rated for either static or dynamic systems. Um, so whether or not the fans are on uh, in uh, the event of a fire, or there'll be a combination fire smoke damper that's always going to be dynamic, and it's also going to have a leakage requirement that we'll talk about a little bit later. For some of these test requirements for fire endurance, um, really the most stringent part typically not only is the fire endurance, but the hose stream that happens afterwards. And typically to fully mimic uh, a fire and a life safety event, uh, what UL does in this test is they expose a damper to fire either an hour and a half or three hours, uh, and then they hit it with a hose stream, and that's to mimic firefighters and first responders getting to the scene and then the firefighters putting out the fire. Um, so basically what you want to make sure is not only that the damper will withstand a fire, but it also will withstand the immense pressure of that fire hose as the firefighters are putting out the fire and moving through the building. Why this is critical is there could clear out a room and and extinguish the fire in that room, but then the fire may be in other areas and you want to make sure the fire in other areas won't get through the extinguished room. Want to make sure the firefighters have a safe way out or a safe as, a safe as possible way out and two, to make it easier to contain that fire and to make sure that fire doesn't spread. Um, typically, there's going to be a cycling test involved with these dampers. We know they're not going to act once. Um, they're going to be cycled a few times after they're installed. Uh, and if they're, say, actuated fire dampers, uh, they could be cycled up to 20,000 times to make sure that actuator can withstand power failures, um, any type of loss of power or building shutdowns, auto building automations, testing the system, periodic testing, things like that. Uh, they also go through some gunking tests. So the sp salt spray exposure test basically exposes the damper uh, to salt uh, for five days to accumulate dust, debris, and other things that are going to be in a typical system, uh, and then allow it to dry. And then the damper has to actuate on its own uh, with the, the heat responsive device, whatever that may be. There's also some factors of safety built in. So spring for, uh, close for, uh, closing force tests that will close uh, to make sure the damper has more spring force than needed. And then some dynamic closure tests uh, for dynamic dampers that once again are designed to close under airflow. And just to uh, reiterate some of the damper certifications, um, one thing the way NFPA and UL uh design guide works is fire rated barriers are not rated for an hour and a half. So typical questions come up is if you have a two hour rated barrier, what do you use? Uh, and NFPA does allow hour and a half rated dampers to protect both one and two hour rated partitions. So you'll have an, a partition that could be rated for an hour, it could be rated for two, but the correct product would be a fire damper or a combination fire smoke damper that is rated for one and a half hours. Uh, the other UL test 
is a three hour fire exposure test. So for dampers that are rated for three hours, they can protect barriers and partitions rated up to four hours. So either three or four hour rated partitions. Uh, and these are both tested in vertical and horizontal installations. And I'll talk about some of the nuances of those installations a little bit later. But once again, just to uh, reiterate some of the types of products uh, for static and dynamic dampers, um, basically static dampers that are designed to close with no fan pressure. So the fans have to shut off uh, in an emergency and they're not going to have to close against airflow. Uh, and typically these are going to be curtain style designs or some of the original round butterfly damper designs um, that are still in use, uh, but were developed quite some time ago. Some of the more recent developments were dynamic dampers, and they've been around for quite some time in the industry. Uh, but some of the uh, Actual certifications change around the year 2000, 2001. Um, so one thing I do get is uh, questions about dampers in the field, uh, especially older dampers. And typically um, any dampers after uh, 2001 have gone through some certifications. And then you all had some additional requirements and testing done around the year 2010. Uh, there were some industry changes uh, that had a little bit of a redesign. They instituted some different testing for actuators, fire smoker and actuators. So typically, and I'll get to this later, um, when you get into older dampers, um, the best bet a lot of times or what will be needed to be current with the code would be a new damper. Um, and that's typically uh, with a dynamic damper that's designed to close against airflow. Uh, typically, is, these are um, these can be curtain style dampers, but typically they uh, have a little bit more structure than a dynamic damper. Typically, they use springs, um, but most often you're going to see a lot of multi-blade and true rounds um, for, say, some of the fire and smoke applications as curtain rated dampers are not legal leakage rated. Some of the fire rated assemblies that are used and protected by fire dampers are firewalls, uh, fire barriers, and fire partitions. Now, firewalls are uh, pretty stringent, and typically they're not penetrated, um, where fire barriers are probably going to be the most common. They can be uh, typically rated up to two hours, and they use, they're used for shaft enclosures, exit enclosures, exit passageways, um, and some horizontal exits. I won't get into some of those details right now. Um, really, the the uh, most important part is knowing where in, say, a set of drawings uh, these barriers are called out. And uh, NFPA does require, and Building Code does require that engineers call out fire dampers um, and what's rated. Uh, so what would be needed, um, the fire damper and the locations. Um, so typically, you don't really need to identify those partitions. Um, but uh, they are. it is good to know some of the differences for that. A lot of times uh, for more generic stud wall designs, whether it's wood or metal stud, uh, a one hour rated uh, barrier typically has one layer of drywall and a two hour rated barrier uh, barriers typically have two layers. Um, that is just a generic thing. Uh, Really, what you'd have to do is look back at the wall design that's stated in the UL Fire Resistance Directory or the Gypsum Association Directory or um, some other design guide that specifies the fire resistance construction. These are just general guidelines. Um, really, what you have to do is call back to that design number and make sure you've got the right product that applies. Uh, for concrete or masonry, um, typically they're going to be load bearing in two to four hours. And one thing to note, and I'll uh, say it again later because it's something I like to reiterate, is for the wood and metal stud and drywall, that's typically for walls. Um, when you've got horizontal assemblies that are made out of wood, there's really no fire damper that can be used to protect a penetration in that floor ceiling assembly or that floor assembly. Um, really what's going to be needed at that point for, say, a through penetration, that's a penetration all the way through the barrier from one side to the other, um, would be a shaft for that type of uh, construction. Or if you've got, say, a concrete or masonry floor, you can install a fire damper to protect that opening horizontally. Now, on a wall, they're all okay. And one thing to note, you always have to check back to the manufacturer's installation instructions, as well as any supplemental instructions that may have additional information for installations such as framing instructions or sleeve terminations. And we'll get into sleeve terminations in a little bit. Once again, just to reiterate, um, for floors that are load-bearing, uh, that 
are allowed for fire damper penetrations, they're going to have to be concrete or masonry. Um, when you've got these floor ceiling assemblies that are load bearing, um, the through penetrations really need to be protected by some other needs than a damper. Um, there are not horizontal fire dampers that can be installed in these through penetrations. And that's critical nowadays when you've got buildings that have, say, the first three or four stories that are concrete, and then the top three or three, two or three stories can be now made of wood and uh, wood structure. And typically they'll use wood joists or wood uh, truss assemblies, but a completely different HVAC design is needed for these types of floors. Um, any, uh, they may use through penetrations below in the concrete structure that is perfectly fine, and a curtain style fire damper could be installed per a manufacturer's instructions. But um, what will happen if you use that same design in the floors above, you'll run into issues where uh, much different assemblies will need to be built to protect the same openings. Um, you can't just put a fire damper in uh, penetration from story to story. Now you have to get into shafts and other uh, different types of assemblies. And typically, um, kind of what that diagram shows below, what you'll have to do in these wood assemblies is penetrate a wall, a shaft wall, and then have penetrations that are rated ceiling or non-rated ceiling and the applicable products for that. Um, that's not going to be a fire damper. That's going to be a ceiling radiation damper. And we have other presentations that we can go through at a later date in our webinar series that gets into ceiling radiation dampers because it is a bit of a, a misunderstood topic in the industry and it does warrant its own um, hour-long webinar because of the intricacies and how those products need to be specified and designed. Uh, and you can look forward to that next year. We'll be setting up some of those presentations in the near future. For static versus dynamic ratings, again, um, just to reiterate, because we do get this question a lot, um, is what dampers are needed. Um, so static dampers are designed to go under no flow, um, and dynamic dampers can close under flow. Now, a dynamic damper can be installed in a static system, but of course, a dynamic damper is shown below, and um, it, it'll have springs, it'll have some uh, additional frame reinforcements and and some things that'll make it withstand that air or close under that airflow uh, and operate properly and that while it can be used in a static system uh, while the damper on top may not have springs it may just close under gravity obviously there's going to be a more economical choice um, for curtain style dampers uh, which these all are uh, there's three main types or sleeve types as they're called in the industry. Um, a type A damper basically has the blades in the frame and the airstream. So if you've got a low pressure system, it's an economical route typically. Um, but when you get into a type uh, a medium velocity pressure system, you may want to use utilize type B dampers where that blade stack at the top of the damper is now at airstream and the pressure drop will be much better. Um, when you get into uh, type C systems uh, with higher velocity systems, uh, uh, basically, the blades and the frames are out of the airstream, um, and that'll allow for better air performance. Um, now, that air performance is typically going to be found under, say, an AMCA certification that exists, not a UL requirement. Um, but there are, uh, it's not a, a, for the most part, most of the multi blade dampers are going to have this. And that's because multi blade dampers are going to be designed, typically, they're all going to be dynamic. Um, and typically, they're all going to be perform in a higher performance system. So they're going to have that air performance certification sometimes. Um, here's a true round and a steel airfoil damper. And they're going to be type A only. And mainly they're type A because there's no way to block, say, the jack shafting, which is required uh, inherently in the device. Um, or... Uh, any way to get the blades out of the airstream. So they're all going to be a type A. Um, now these curtain dampers are pretty much an accordion style curtain um, that basically uh, are all used uh, with fusible links. Um, and typically they're either going to be installed in uh, vertical walls or floors, um, at concrete floors or um, wood stud, metal stud or concrete or masonry walls. Um, and typically your multi-blade dampers are mostly found with say a triple V or an airfoil blade. 
Um, and they can, they're uh, certified the same type of walls. Uh, you'll also see true round dampers if you've got round duct or if you've got a whole cord or poured into a concrete wall or floor. Uh, true round ducts, uh, true round blade dampers are a good option for round duct applications. Um, retaining angles are required basically uh, at every fire damper installation with the exception of maybe some fire stop caulking installations that I'll show uh, later. But the industry standard are going to be uh, dual side retaining angles. Um, now there are some single side angles available and those sizes allowed are per the manufacturer. Um, so there's some general guidelines here, but typically um, you have to reference the manufacturer's instructions for what you you can do for a single side. Uh, now for a dual side angle, basically they're attached to the damper sleeve on both sides of the wall or floor and they're uh, sandwiching that partition to make sure the damper stays in place under the fire exposure and the hose stream. And this is basically not only to keep the damper in place, but also to cover gaps uh, that are found between the damper and the part the duct opening in that fire rate partition. For the single side angles, uh, they are attached to the damper, but they will then have to be attached to the partition due to uh, to allow that to stay in place during the fire event. Um, now, for some of the fusible links, um, these are basically a eutectic solder between it two pieces of metal um, that are designed to hold certain weights. Um, static dampers are going to be lighter. They can be around 10 pounds. Um, with dynamic dampers, with, their, with heavier duty springs, uh, needing springs that can withstand up to 50 pounds or more of force. Um, now, these are solder joints, so they do not go off at the exact specified temperature. Um, you could see uh, even in the hot summer in a shipping container um, in the south or southwest, uh, you could see some temperatures spiking at over 140 degrees. So with the high temperature shrink wrap and the vibration of the truck, um, it could potentially happen that you could see some dampers fail prematurely. And typically that's not a defect in the fusible link. That's just uh, the nature of fusible links. They will close um, depending on the forces that they see potentially before the set point they're not they don't close exactly at the set point um, so because of that uh, if you do run into instances where um, there are some higher temperature say duct heaters um, anything any source of heat in the duct you can use a higher temperature link to prevent some of those nuisance closures and here's just a couple of pictures of some fuse length installed. As you can see with the damper on the left, it's a much lighter uh, spring or much lighter fusible link because the damper does not have springs where the damper on the right does have springs and needs a little bit heavier duty of a spring uh, and a link. Some option, options that are required um, uh, for these types of dampers, uh, every damper needs to have some type of duct access. Uh, this is required by code uh, to make sure you can inspect the damper um, both after installation and then with some prevent um, periodic testing uh, required by code. Um, so typically, um, each damper is going to have a sleeve, which has uh, got a six inch extension out of the wall, um, but it can be a uh, 20 gauge or heavier, depending on the size of the damper or uh, for rigid duct connections. Um, but you will, uh, as that access door shows, um, what you can do is put an access door uh, then in the ductwork to allow access to that damper. Um, the dampers are going to connect to duct with either different transitions um, or uh, slip joint type connections or TDC flanges. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, some of the different breakaway type connections and where they're used. Um, typically, the installations are going to be uh, vertical in walls. So this is a little uh, cause for confusion because you've got horizontal duct and sometimes the contractor calls out horizontal duct, but it, at that point, it would be a vertical damper because it's penetrating a wall in the vertical plane, um, whereas a vertical duct that's penetrating a floor or going through a shaft is going to uh, need a horizontal damper for uh, those concrete or masonry 
concrete floors. Um, pretty much everything needs uh, retaining angles. And a couple of notes, the damper does need to close within the wall or floor. Um, so basically the middle of the damper blades have to close within that barrier at some point. Now it does not need to be centered. Uh, we get that question a lot. Uh, where, you know, our instructions are perfect and they show out a great installation where the damper is right in the middle of the wall, but that doesn't always happen. And the damper can close uh, uh, within the wall, uh, but be shifted to one side or another, or say the top of a floor or the bottom of a floor if that's where the access is. Uh, now, if the damper has to be mounted outside of the wall, um, they're out of partition dampers or grill access dampers. Uh, these are commonly used in shaft walls, um, say in a corridor where you're uh, feeding air into that corridor and then you have a grill access, um, but you can't have a damper protruding into that corridor. Uh, it makes it a little bit cleaner so you can then mount that damper outside of the wall. Now, these are all tested very specifically for that application, and they're going to be uh, typically smaller in size than other fire dampers. Your breakaway connection is going to be required, um, and basically that's to stop the damper from ripping out of the wall if there happens to be debris falling from up above an emergency. Um, and typically the maximum UL rated sleeve extension is six inches or 16 inches if an access door or a smoke detector is installed. Um, it's a little bit different for combination fire smoke dampers, and I'll get into that when we can see a picture of the actuator. Um, now, for these duct connections, um, it can be just a raw connection like an A, a B, or a C, um, or you can get different ovals or flange-type connections if you are using some of those flange-type breakaway or you're using that flange for, say, a slip-and-drive type connection. Uh, that's going to be set up for that. Moving into combination fire and smoke dampers, um, basically combination fire and smoke dampers are required wherever there's a fire rated barrier. So that barrier has a one, two, three or four hour rating and there is a leakage requirement. So there is uh, we'll talk a little bit about the different leakage classes in a bit. Um, but basically, not only will it stop fire from spreading, it'll also stop smoke from spreading, which is uh, the biggest potential for loss of life is going to be through smoke spreading. So uh, there are a lot of applications, particularly in shaft walls or corridors where fire smoke dampers or fire and smoke dampers are needed. Um, now, the most economical route a lot of times for this is going to be a fire and smoke damper compared to, say, a smoke and a fire damper. That's typically only uh, recommended when you've got a retrofit and you can't physically get that fire damper out of the wall, but it still can uh, be tested and still works through periodic testing. Some of the different standards um, for the combination fire smoke dampers on top of the UL555 is the UL555S certification. And basically, uh, that's going to have both a dynamic testing requirements as well as some leakage testing requirements. Um, so they're for smoke dampers and for combination fire smoke dampers. Um, smoke dampers don't need that fire rating, um, so they won't have some of the same installs, and we'll talk about that when we get to the smoke damper section. Um, now, the additional testing for UL555S is going to be some leakage testing, which typically starts at four inches of water um, and has a different... Uh, set of leakage allowances based on the class. And I've got that laid out a little clearer in uh, some other slides, so I won't get too into that. Um, but there's also some operations testing. So um, different dampers are designed to uh, close under different airflows. And as you increase that airflow, you're going to increase that uh, amount of torque that are needed. So typically what happens um, is larger actuators or potentially smaller sections will be needed when you get into uh, higher pressures and uh, velocities, flow ratings for these systems. Now, there are different temperature tests as well. Um, so we'll talk about passive and active smoke control systems in a little bit, um, but they may be rated to different temperatures. So the minimum temperature test for a smoke damper is going to be 250 degrees. Um, that makes sense. Uh, the airflow uh, in, a, in a fire uh, may not be 
up to say it's going to be above 165 it's going to be more than 50 degrees above ambient but it may not be above say 250 um, so you can start your testing at 250 uh, to make sure it can withstand and operate under those elevated temperatures but um, if you get into some of these smoke control systems that are designed for higher performance and the fans are used to exhaust smoke they're going to see even higher temperatures so those dampers may be certified up to uh, may need to be certified up to 350 degrees. Now, as you're increasing that temperature, you're also, um, in effect, increasing the effective flow rate uh, as you heat up that air. So these dampers do require a lot more torque when you get into these extended uh, temperatures. Um, now for cycling, um, some of the uh, cycling tests is the same as UL555. Uh, say if a smoke damper is uh, all fire smoke, uh, combination fire smoke and smoke dampers are typically going to have an actuator on them. Um, so what's going to happen is uh, they're going to have to close under loss of power and to once again uh, simulate that they're going to be cycled 20,000 times just so there's a factor of safety there. Uh, additionally, if you're going to use a, a smoke damper or a combination fire smoke damper for volume control, they're going to be cycled up to 100,000 times uh, because they will be readjusted multiple times through the day um, as that volume control damper. One note, the combination fire smoke dampers will be certified to both UL555 and 555S. Uh, here's those leakage and airflow temperatures, uh, airflow and temperature ratings uh, laid out. Basically, uh, when these tests were, were started, building code allowed class three dampers. That's going to be the most leakage. Um, it has since been amended. Uh, the minimum leakage class for uh, per the international building code is going to be a class two. Um, but now there are some jurisdictions that do require a class one. And in some of these higher performance systems, some engineers do specify the class one to have the lowest uh, leakage rating possible. But now, uh, currently, the uh, minimum leakage class is class two. Uh, you will see uh, damper manufacturing that have class three dampers, um, they may be used in areas where uh, international building code is not specified. So typically that's going to be internationally. Um, but for the most part, most of the dampers seen in the U.S. now are going to be class two or class one. Um, and then uh, we've got the 2,000 feet per minute and four inches of water that are the minimum airflow uh, and pressure for these dampers. Um, now, they can be certified to higher pressures, higher air flows, and higher temperatures, but these are going to be the most common uh, limits and certifications. Um, and basically, the size limits are going to be based on both the maximum single section and the minimum size. Uh, there's also going to be a maximum assembly size that's allowed. And these are typically all publicly shown in the UL fire resistance directory under each damper manufacturer's listing number. Uh, typical material um, can range anywhere from 20 gauge up to 14 or 10 gauge. Um, when you get into some rigid connections or you get into say jails or places where uh, they wanna make sure people can't cut through the duct, you will get heavier ducts and uh, duct gauges, and that is applicable. Um, most common is going to be galvanized steel, but there are some stainless steel options available from different manufacturers. Um, for uh, the fire and smoke rated assemblies, um, you can have uh, smoke barriers that are typically one hour rated. Um, there are smoke partitions that may be zero hour rated, so they'll only need a smoke damper. Um, uh, but the, if you've got a fire rating and you see below um, there's a smoke damper called out because there's a smoke barrier, that smoke barrier does not have a fire rating. Um, but that floor where the concrete floor that's shown um, needs to be protected by a fire damper because that does have a fire an hour rating. Um, when you see in that little diagram, that one hour partition off to the left there, that would require most likely a fire and smoke damper because it is a smoke, probably a smoke barrier and a fire barrier, um, which is gonna be typical in your smoke barriers, your shaft enclosures, but more commonly, uh, uh, not uh, any more commonly than shaft enclosures, but uh, also for corridor walls.
the multi-blade dampers um, typically are going to be triple V or some type of airfoil blade. Um, and uh, basically uh, they're going to be, they're going to start with a fire resistance up to two hours, just like your fire damper. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, all fire and smoke dampers are going to be dynamically rated. Uh, you're not going to have a static fire smoke damper due to the specifications called out in UL 555S. Uh, and typically they're all going to have seals. Um, now uh, you also have true round options available. Uh, one thing to note out there, um, instead of a fusible length, this is the uh, uh, one thing to note is the temperature response of the device at the top of that uh, damper that's connected to the actuator. And that's basically a bimetallic disc that uh, closes and trips to cut power to the actuator, uh, one, to make sure the actuator is not energized, and two, to allow the spring of that actuator to close the damper. Um, for this standard installation, um, when you've got a vertical plane, you're going to use the same type of angles that we talked about for a fire damper because it is a um, fire damper as well as a smoke rated damper. Um, now, when you do get into horizontal planes, um, you can uh, basically do the same type of installation as a fire damper as well. Um, but one common thing a lot of manufacturers have is single side angles. Now, one question we get a lot that I like to point out with this installation is with the single side angles in a floor, can you use them on the bottom of the assembly? And typically, uh, that's not going to be allowed. Most of the time, that is that those angles have to be on top of the partition if you want to use single side angles for a horizontal installation. Now, one thing to note, um, for the sleeve extensions outside of the wall, uh, the six, the six inch standard typically applies to the non jack shaft side of the damper. Um, the 16 inch requirement, uh, or the 16 inch allowance, uh, is allowed for any combination fire smoke dampers that, ha or a fire damper that has an actuator. Um, and you're going to have to reference the manufacturer's instructions to verify that for all of your installs, but that is typically a UL standard. Now, uh, combination fire smoke dampers and fire dampers will all have some type of sleeve duct connection. Um, this is when I like to talk about some of these breakaway or rigid connections. Uh, some of the no, uh, original UL approved uh, connections are uh, S-type uh, breakaway connections, um, but there are some different flange-type breakaway connections as well. Um, most of these are pretty well controlled by UL, but you will have to look at each manufacturer's instructions to reference anything specific. The S-type, um, these S-type flange, uh, uh, or these S-type hems, excuse me, installs and breakaway connections are pretty industry standard um, and the slip and drive connections are in the UL standards. Um, now UL will certify some of these different flange type connections like duct mate ward or nexus um, but you will have to reference those manufacturer's instructions for any specific guidelines as well as reference a, a damper manufacturer's instructions uh, to show what will be allowed. One other type of breakaway connection uh, can be a damper sleeve with a collar. And at that point, the duct connection and the breakaway point is dictated typically by the number of fasteners used to attach that collar to the duct, um, what, with that collar typically being considered part of the damper sleeve. For passive smoke control systems, these are going to be some of the original smoke control systems that I've seen in the industry. And basically the fan shut down uh, and basically this, the building works with compartmentalization and containment to stop fire and smoke from spreading. Um, and basically there'll be um, a passive barrier for the smoke. They're not using fan power to exhaust fan out and they're not using fan fa fan power to pressurize non-affected areas. Uh, these were the first and probably most common smoke control systems. But now uh, we're getting into some active smoke control systems uh, or engineered smoke control. Uh, and basically these use pressurization and exhaust uh, to uh, keep the building safe from loss of life. And basically smoke will be trapped uh, by being pressurized in effective areas. Uh, and then in the fire zone, um, they'll try to exhaust smoke out as much as possible while keeping uh, areas outside of the fire zone uh, supplied with 
clean air um, to keep it overly pressurized. And here's a diagram of that. Basically, you've got in the middle of that building, you've got a fire event. And what they do is they close off the air supplies and open up the returns, and that'll act as an exhaust and create a low pressure area. That low pressure area uh, will then be augmented by some high pressure areas around the fire where they open up the supply and close off the exhaust. Now this does two things. This basically creates a little bit of pressure um, to as the building degrades due to the fire, there are going to be cracks and things in these smoke rated barriers and smoke could potentially get through. So with this active smoke control system, you've got an added protection while you're exhausting that smoke in the non-affected areas. Once you get into smoke dampers, basically smoke dampers are um, used in areas that are not either fire rated. So if you've got a barrier that doesn't have a fire rating, it won't stand up to that fire resistance, but it may be a leakage rated barrier. Um, say in hospitals, you see these a lot where they've got uh, maximum allowed smoke zones. And uh, if you get outside uh, larger than those areas, you'll have to put up a smoke barrier um, where there may not be any other barriers present. Uh, basically for these applications, or if you've got an application where you've got a fire damper protecting a fire barrier that's been reclassified as a smoke barrier, you can use a smoke damper. And the main thing for the smoke dampers is they don't have a temperature responsive device. So they are either tied into a smoke detector locally or tied into an alarm system and it can be controlled that way to stop the spread of smoke. And we'll go back to this diagram once again, um, showing combination fire smokes, fire dampers, and smoke bar uh, smoke dampers. And as you can see um, where those FSDs were called out, you may be in a building where, uh, say in those shafts, uh, they have existing fire dampers. You can now install a smoke damper uh, within 24 inches of that barrier and maintain the smoke rating of that barrier. And this kind of shows that. Um, so basically, you've got no openings between the barrier and the damper, and you've got that smoke damper in the duct. Um, you're going to want to use some type of silicone sealant or caulking that'll protect the barrier and the damper once it's installed. Now, one thing to note, there are no retaining angles required for these. Uh, they will need to be supported um, by additional structure as they're not going to be using the wall for support or the fire barrier for support and the framing required for that. Um, but uh, uh, typically, that'll be up to the building designers, um, and they, they can be installed vertically or horizontally um, as uh, application sees fit. Now we're going to get into some general uh, guidelines and questions that come up, uh, some general questions about dampers. Um, as I noted uh, before, um, damper access is needed. Uh, so there is going to be some testing required by local code and applicable NFPA specifications. Um, and these uh, basically require access to all damper locations for inspection and testing. Now, that inspection has to be done after the damper is installed for commissioning of the building. Um, but there is going to be some periodic schedule set up and required based on the different building types um, uh, so you pretty much have to reference that uh, for the maintenance. But to do that, there's going to have to be some type of access and that'll have to be done either through access doors or some removable portion of ductwork. Typically for installation tips, um, you have to, I can't specify this enough, you have to be very uh Com, uh, confident with the installation instructions. Um, they're going to be different allowances per manufacturer. Um, the spacing shown there may be generic. Um, so you probably want to reference the different manufacturers instructions for what's allowed. Um, this is just some generic guidelines. Um, now, uh, with say the overlap of the angles um, or the fastener spacing. Um, some may be more, some may be less, depending on the type of damper uh, and uh, the different certifications for each manufacturer. And because of that, it's very critical to be very fluent with the different instructions for the dampers you're working with. Um, but some general guidelines, uh, you want to make sure the damper is free of foreign objects. Um, uh, shipping damage happens all the time. It is uh, something that you're going to run into with every manufacturer, and things do happen on the job site. So uh, you want to make sure that the damper is not damaged. That 
before install. Um, the jack shaft's not bent or misaligned. Uh, it could even be ripped out of the assembly. So you want to make sure that there is no damage before you go through and install dampers. Um, you want to make sure the damper's not racked. Uh, and one critical thing is making sure you don't screw into the damper linkage, which will stop the damper from operating. Um, you can screw into the damper linkage or you can screw into the frame of a curtain style damper that could stop that damper from operating correctly. Uh, now, uh, you will have to cycle the damper after installation to meet these NFPA requirements. So typically it's very good it's good practice, um, say, for motorized dampers to have some type of way to power the damper to make sure it closes under its own actuator power. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later for some uh, what's locally accepted uh, and what's not accepted and what would, would need local approval. But before that, there are some new uh, designs in the industry that I'd like to talk about. Uh, now, I talked about no dampers being installed horizontally in wood or metal stud openings or floor ceiling assemblies. Um, now, those are typically going to be load-bearing uh, floor ceiling assemblies, but there is a UL design I-503 that's relatively new. It's a pretty restrictive, heavier-duty metal stud type of barrier that was originally designed for the tops and bottoms of shafts. And basically, uh, because of the tops and bottoms of shafts, uh, do will require some type of installation. What, uh, what you're gonna run into is if you want to protect that horizontal penetration, you're either gonna have to run the shaft all the way to the floor, all the way to the ceiling, and then penetrate it through the sidewall. Or with this new design, you can, and the shaft with this assembly and then install a, a fire damper or fire smoke damper horizontally. Um, now you will have to look up this design number to see what manufacturers are approved. Uh, and of course, look at the manufacturer specific installation instruction, uh, cause that's really gonna be the only way you'll get a full picture as to how these dampers are used. But it is an option, a horizontal option that's relatively new to the industry. Uh, some additional uh, installations uh, that manufacturers have are three-sided angle installations. And basically, there are some uh, applications where a damper may be tied to a ceiling or a wall or a floor, and you can't use a traditional type of mounting angle. So what you'll have to do is go to each damper manufacturer and see if they have a UL instruction approved for this type of installation. Um, and then you may be able to remove the mounting angle on one side or more sides of the damper, depending on the manufacturer, and use fire stop caulk. But typically the most common is going to be, uh, most common practice is going to be removing the angle from one side and having uh, the traditional mounting angles on the three remaining sides. Another common uh, modification that happens is uh, sleeve extension. Now, um, it may not be known how uh, thick the fire rated barrier is, the depth of the wall, or um, where that damper may need to be located, and uh, the factory supplied sleeve may not be long enough to connect the duct. Uh, in that instance. And what happens is uh, a sleeve extension is needed. And typically, uh, UL certifies these instructions and they require that the sleeve extension have fasteners outside of the fire rated barrier. Now, what that typically means is you can either have an extension where um, the existing sleeve connect reaches all the way through the barrier, uh, but um, it needs a, some type of extension, so you just connect a sleeve extension to uh, that end of the damper. Um, now, the same requirements still apply, the 16-inch max, say, on an actuator side, or if you've got an access door, or the 6-inch max um, if you've got uh, no access door and it's a non-actuated side of the damper. Now, uh, you could run into an issue where the sleeve doesn't reach all the way through the partition. And in that case, you're going to need to use a sleeve extension that goes all the way through the partition and connects to the factory sleeve outside of that damper. And that's where the diagram on the right comes into play. Um, now, one other thing to note, the damper, the final location of the damper does not to be centered in the partition. Um, it can be uh, shifted to one side or the other, but you do have to make sure that the blades do close in that rated partition.
some other modifications that you may run into uh, that are typically uh, needed um, could be uh, cutting or trimming the, the damper sleeve. And basically, um, a couple of common things where you're cutting or trimming into the damper sleeve could be to run uh, ne the, any necessary electrical wiring or pneumatic tubing to um, indication switches or internally mounted actuators, especially if you're using, say, an out of partition damper. Um, and that is typically allowed. Um, you have to check the manufacturer's instructions for that or check with the specific manufacturer. But a lot of times you all will allow um, holes to be drilled in and cut into sleeves if necessary to run uh, the specific uh, electrical or pneumatic tubing to the actuators. Now, things to note, the holes should be as small as possible, um, but typically there aren't a lot of guidelines around that. Uh, and all wiring must meet local code. So what happens a lot of times um, is inspectors may require a junction box be added to the sleeve at that point to meet local uh electrical code. Now, that's going to be different per region, so you may want to know that in advance before cutting some of these holes into a sleeve. Um, now, different manufacturers, and this would be specific to the manufacturer, may allow some trimming uh, due to field conditions. And typically, if sleeves are allowed to be trimmed, they cannot affect actuators, linkages, or any other factory-supplied electrical or mechanical components. So typically, this is only going to be allowed if you're cutting away a small portion of the sleeve to fit up the ductwork. Um, if you're completely cutting a sleeve away, um, you may get into some modifications that are outside these manufacturer's guidelines. Uh, now, after all of these modifications, whether you're adding a sleeve extension or potentially cutting away a portion of the sleeve, you will have to cycle dampers, uh, cycle the dampers to make sure they will operate. Um, and now this gets into some applications that require local approval and some don't. Um, now, typically these can be uh, as complicated as a case-by-case -case basis, but for some general guidelines, UL does allow actuators to replace in what are called like-for-like -like situations. Now, one of the things here is it has to be a factory certified technician, so most of the time it is someone from a manufacturer has to come out to do these modifications to make sure that the damper will meet the UL certification once the modifications are done. Um, typically, this allows for direct replacement, direct replacement of malfunctioning actuators, or if actuator models that need indication switches uh, can be substituted for, say, models, the identical models that don't have switches, um, or if you run into instances where uh, you've got uh, identical actuators that have different power ratings. So say you... Uh, purchased a damper with 120 volt actuator but 24 volt is needed um you can swap like for like exact model for exact model uh, if a factory certified technician does it now if any other modifications done outside or not by a factory certified technician, uh, all these modifications will require a local approval from the authority having jurisdiction. Um, that could be the building inspector, that could be the fire marshal, that could be um, the inspector or uh, anyone in charge of certifying and uh, final inspection of the building for occupancy. Um, and typically, um, any modification, whether it's to actuator wiring other than, say, wiring up to the manufacturer's wiring diagram, uh, moving temperature responsive devices because of duct access, moving, um, removing or moving smoke detectors and then wiring them back in if they were factory wired, uh, replacing actuators with non-identical actuator models. This typically comes into play when you've got older dampers that are being retrofitted um, with actuator models that are no longer existed, uh, existent or actuator models that may be obsolete. Um, and typically what's going to happen for those is there should be a log of modifications that's filled out and that's kept with the file for the building uh, and the uh, contractor, whoever's doing the work, will need to work with the AHJ to make, cert make sure that the damper is acceptable. Uh, the AHJ will sign off on that and that record stays with the building to make sure uh, there's a clear record of what's done. Uh, typically after these modifications, uh, there's going to be some cycling needed um, to make sure that the damper will still operate as intended. And typically that needs to be witnessed by the authority having jurisdiction.
that pretty much concludes everything. I know that was a lot of information. I know um, not everyone may have been able to uh, get uh, all their questions answered. So basically, if you've got any additional questions, you can respond to this e uh, the email uh, from this, or you can respond to me directly. My email address address is J Carlin. That's J C A R L I N at Potorf. P O T T O R F F dot com. Uh, and it's in the chat box below as well. Uh, and you can certainly reach out to me or reach out to anyone directly if you've got any additional information. Thank you for uh, joining us for this webinar this morning. And once again, if you need some credit, uh, some CE credit, feel free to reach out to us with your AIA number or any other information in your email, and we will get those credits out as soon as possible. Thank you and have a good day.